Trail Tales time. What's going on, everybody? My name is Kyle Grady. I am a through hiker. I am a backpacker. I am a huge hiking nerd. And every single week on this podcast, I chat with other hiking nerds about their experiences on the trail. Folks, this episode is it's amazing. I'm so hyped about this episode. It might be one of my favorite ever because it's very unique. This week's guest is Lloyd Vogel. He is the CEO and co-founder of Garage Grown Gear. Now, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Garage Grown Gear. And one thing I just want to say right off the top here, this is not sponsored. Uh, He's not paying me to come on here. The reason I wanted to have Lloyd on is because I got the chance to meet him and we just really hit it off and he was a really cool dude. And Garage Grown Gear is a very unique uh, business in the hiking gear space. And so I wanted to hear all about how it came to be. And it was so fun, dude. We've got some, dude, Trail Tales has just been popping off lately. Quadzilla last week, Garage Grown Gear. Next week's episode, I won't spoil it, but it's also going to be a banger. And so if you appreciate all of that, folks, please, 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 number one, subscribe or follow the show on whatever podcast app you use. And number two, leave a five-star review, dude. Let's, uh, let's get those five-star reviews up. I love reading them. And one exciting, actually, a very exciting piece of news. Ready? You're going to be stoked for this. Um, Trail Tales is now on YouTube. I know. Isn't that so exciting? It is actually quite exciting for me. Every single Trail Tales episode is now on YouTube. Right now, it's audio only. But going forward, sometime in the near future, I'd like to experiment with doing video podcasts, both you know, the remote video, but honestly in person is ideal. Eventually my, my dream for the show is to have every episode in person, like a proper podcast on YouTube. And, um, and so you got to go subscribe to the trail tales, YouTube channel. Even if you're going to keep listening on Spotify or Apple or whatever, go subscribe to the trail tales, YouTube channel. It's at trail tales pod. I'll have a link to it in the show notes. Please go subscribe. I'm thinking about maybe posting some like bonus content on there. I got to think of some ideas for that to entice you. But let's get the subscribers pumped up on there. It's embarrassing how little subscribers I have because I've just started it. And so go subscribe to that channel. Let's do it. Episode number 153, I think. Yeah, 153 with Lloyd Vogel of Garage Grown Gear. So as some of you know, I went to PCT Trail Days this year, 2023. It was such an amazing time. I met so many cool people. And one of the cool people I met was Lloyd Vogel. And so I was chilling with him and a bunch of other people. I think I think it was Darwin on the trail. I was I was kind of I was eating dinner with Darwin and Lloyd was one of the people at the table and, you know, we'd introduced ourselves, but I didn't really know who he was. Um, the next day I was just hanging out by some of the vendors, uh, Miranda in not Miranda in the wild. Oh boy. And Miranda goes outside was there and, um, she also knew Lloyd. And so I was kind of hanging out with the two of them. And then I was like, Oh, this Lloyd, this Lloyd cat is pretty cool. I should, uh, I should connect with him on Instagram. And so I look at his Instagram and right there in the header, it says CEO of Garage Grown Gear. And I was like, what? So I knew that Lloyd worked for Garage Grown Gear, but I did not realize that he was the CEO. And we, at this point, we had spent <laughs> quite a bit of time together. And so it was really cool. It was, um, you know, he was just very genuine. And I really feel like we, uh, we connected well over the course of Trail Days. And so I told him that I wanted to have him on Trail Tales. And, well... Here we are. So, Lloyd, dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, um, yeah, I'm excited to uh, talk to you today. Same, Kyle. Yeah, it was so great being able to to meet you in person at PCT Days, especially after, you know, watching a lot of your videos. And uh, <laughs> it's one of those funny things of, yeah, like, I knew who you were. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of one of the funny things about running an online business is, uh, yeah, most people don't really know who... <laughs> <laughs> who you are which is uh just fine but yeah a funny a funny element yeah you're too humble dude you should that should be like the first thing kind of like i don't know if you've seen uh the office but 
Bob Vance from Vance Refrigeration. Like anytime he introduces himself, he's like, hi, I'm Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. That should be you. You should be like, hi, I'm Lloyd Vogel, CEO of Garage Grown Gear. No, you, <laughs> you probably shouldn't do that. But maybe at trail days, I don't know, because you were, you were super humble about it. It was cool. Well, there's just so many people at events like Trail Day. And I think it's hard because, you know, I think like a lot of folks in the in the outdoor space, you have like a lot of different delineations of like, yes, uh, of garage grown gear, but like also a hiker, also yeah. someone who just like is part of the community. And so it's a, uh, you know, and sometimes it's just kind of nice to like be a dude at a thing. Yeah, and, that's um, true. That's fair. Yeah. Especially, I imagine you probably go to a decent amount of events and stuff like that. So, yeah, and, and you guys didn't have a booth either. I was kind of surprised. Was there, did you try to get a booth or do you think you will in the future or anything? Maybe. I kind of like just being able to, to roam oh, around. Okay. Uh, I mean, it would definitely be fun to have a booth there. We, I thought about it a couple of years back um, and wanted to do kind of like a combo booth for a bunch of, uh, uh, or a handful of small brands. Um, but they were pretty against the idea of a of a combo booth, which to some extent makes sense. They want yeah. people to be able to get their own booths. But uh, at that point, like in time, it just didn't make sense for us just to roll up and not sell stuff. So, mm. um, but I, yeah, I think it's something that we might do in the future or figure out how to be able to, to partner with PCT Days. I feel like I mean, we had almost 40 of our brands there this year, which was just kind of wild. Yeah, uh, I guess that also makes sense too. It's like you guys are selling a lot of these different brands. And so how would you like have your own booth? I guess that makes yeah. it a little complicated too. I didn't think about that. There's something nice about like, I don't know. We might just like do a booth next year and try to have some like little, like small group forums or conversations inviting like brand founders and stuff to like oh, yeah. talk at our booth or just like, I don't know, give away a lot of stuff. And I don't know. There's probably some cool ways for us to be able to interface with it. And this upcoming year, I think we are trying to generally attend more stuff because uh largely um most of our garage ground crew just kind of like hangs out in minnesota and doesn't really uh <laughs> go to events and festivals and oh stuff. okay well shit. i'm sure i know you guys have a lot of work to uh to be doing constantly but <laughs> there are a lot of boxes to pack yeah so so lloyd um i'm sure most people listening or a lot of them anyways are familiar with garage grown gear but for those that aren't um i feel like we need an introduction to to who to who you are first of all and um, an introduction to what Garage Grown Gear is. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm Lloyd. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Garage Grown Gear. And uh, Garage Grown is a online retail platform that sells products from ultralight and cottage outdoor brands. So, uh, yeah, we sell gear from all of like the little the little makers and shakers <laughs> in the world. Yeah, from, man. Uh, Folks just sewing backpacks in their basement to uh, some bigger companies that we like to say kind of come out of the uh, cottage tradition or kind of like legacy cottage brands. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have a online store that you can buy stuff from. Uh, and then we have a bunch of like content of like gear reviews and brand profiles and stuff that we do as well. But uh, yeah, kind of just like a, a hub of things having to do with ultralight backpacking and cottage brands. Yeah, man. Um, I want to talk quite a bit about the the gear aspect of things, obviously, because that's quite relevant um, when it comes to garage grown gear. But I also want to talk maybe even more so about just how garage grown gear came to be, because this is something I'm very fascinated by, because it's a very I think I, I, I'm sure I, I told you this at Trail Days, but it's a very unique concept. And I think you guys have a very unique um, presence in the in the, I don't know, backpacking through hiking community and uh, in industry, obviously. And so I want to hear about how it started and everything. So yeah. <laughs> my understanding, and feel free to elaborate on this more, but my understanding is that you you didn't start under the Garage Grown Gear name. You kind of had your own your own business. Is that correct? First, separate from Garage Grown Gear? Yep, that's correct. Yeah, uh, I started a, a company called Big Outdoors that essentially took um, it bought products from custom manufacturers like Superior Wilderness Designs and Through Pack and like uh, Luke's Ultralight when they were still around, and basically bought them in 
I don't know, calling it bulk is a little bit of a misnomer, <laughs> but we bought more than one of them at a time. Yeah. And then we uh, sold them off of our website as like ready to ship type of products. Um, and so I did that while I was, I was a high school special ed teacher and I had uh, guided trips and like worked at a summer camp for a number of years, kind of doing backpacking and kayaking trips. And uh, yeah, I was getting a little burnt out of teaching and was just kind of wondering what I wanted to do next. So I, uh, yeah, what? started randomly started a company with really no idea what I was doing. And <laughs> of course, just selling products that I liked. <laughs> so, 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 well, first of all, I guess pretty much, I'm sure most people when they start something like that, they have no idea. I didn't know what I was doing when I started this podcast. And if you don't believe me, go and listen to the early episodes. But um, <laughs> some would say I still don't know what I'm doing, but I digress. Um, what was the idea behind that first business, though? Or, or, or not the idea, I guess. Um, I don't know, the the strategy. Like, why did you think that was a, a good idea, I guess, in terms yeah. of both a, a business-wise and just, like, interest-wise? Well, I just kind of, like, remember stumbling into the cottage industry. And I think people, I think this resonates, and hopefully this will resonate with some of the people listening, is that it's something that if you, that you can, like, totally ignore and not even know that it exists and then when you stumble into it you're kind of surprised by how many little little companies that there are out there mm -hmm. um so i think for like the vast majority of of my time kind of uh, uh both personally and professionally in the outdoor space i i kind of just knew of like a handful of these little brands and they kind of had mis mystique around them but um you know i didn't i didn't really know anything about them uh or um yeah, kind of like what their what their backgrounds were, what their stories were. It was hard to be able to find them. Uh, a lot of these cottage brands kind of had websites that looked like they were built in the early '90s. They were just <laughs> challenging to be able to navigate. What um what um, what year is this, by the way, that we're talking right now? This is like 20, uh, 2016, 2015. Wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Man. So not like that long ago, but I mean, yeah, I mean, still like we still have brands right now that have websites that yeah. are very dated, but no, it's, it, it's true. Like the, um, the whole ultralight cottage thing has like exploded even since that time Usually. period. You're like, I remember I've said this before, like on previous episodes, but when I first started getting into backpacking and researching this ultralight gear, it was like around 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. And, it's crazy how much it's changed since then. And even, yeah, like 20, 2016, like, I mean, obviously it was established, but yeah, it's nothing compared to, to what it is now. No. Um, super cool, man. Super cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see just how, yeah, you know, all, REI is selling ultralight products. Like the term ultralight has become so prevalent that yeah. one really has to question like, what is ultralight? <laughs> yeah. Like, because it's just so much of an adjective now um, rather than like a discipline of, <laughs> of backpacking. But uh, it's yeah, all, I th Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I, I think it was just really trying to like in the, with, with big outdoors, it's just like trying to take something that I didn't feel like was particularly accessible or take something that not a lot of people I think were paying attention to and, and try to get more people to pay attention to it mm. to make it like easier for people to find cool things. Uh, and they kind of just consolidated into, into one particular spot. And um, I, I came up with the idea while I was at a, a craft show in, uh, in San Francisco and I was just roaming around looking at all of these different small vendors and they were selling like everything from like candles to random t-shirts to <laughs> i don't know jewelry and being like wow all of these independent little shops like these are the culmination of people's hopes and dreams like these are the things that people spend you know late nights thinking about and it's their first thought in the in the morning when they wake up and there's like hundreds of these of these little brands just kind of like hoping for a shot hoping for an opportunity hoping for some type of like spark that helps them take off and thinking about how many obstacles all of those little brands have just in terms of like trying to do everything themselves. Uh, and so that kind of was just what made me think of like, well, what are the things that I like? What are the types of things that I would be interested in, in kind of, I don't know, focusing on. And uh, it's kind of where, where big outdoors came from. Did you, were you ever um, full time on big outdoors or were you still teaching during the entire time that you were um, running that company? I was teaching the entire time. So yeah, it was, was still more of like a side hustle or very much say? a side hustle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
No, it makes sense. It makes sense. I love the side hustle, dude. I love yeah. the side hustle. Side hustle was where it was at. And I, I mean, I didn't necessarily know. Again, I had no idea what I was doing. I just like sunk every penny I had into inventory, <laughs> uh, started some like kind of crappy um, Squarespace website. Uh, you know, I was running it out of my apartment, like spare bedroom, um, really had like no idea or particular ambitions for what to do with it. It was just like something that made me not lose my brain while I was uh, while I was teaching. So mm-hmm. that felt like, uh, yeah, something that was like almost like a fun side hobby slash side hustle. And uh, obviously it kind of evolved into some other stuff. But Yeah, which we're going to which we're definitely going to get to. Um, I have another question about this time period. Yeah. So you're talking about how you wanted to help make this whole cottage ultralight thing more accessible to people. Mm-hmm. Was there also a um a feeling that perhaps this this um this ultralight trend, whatever you want to call it, was going to grow going forward and maybe that this was even kind of the future of through hiking and backpacking and maybe it was a good idea to kind of get in on this now before it really um blew up or or grew was there any like um forward thinking in regards to that i think a little bit but i think it took a little while to, for me to to really realize that there was interest in kind of what we were doing um and i and you know i think it's it's hard um at the time like it felt like ultralight backpacking was starting to kind of weave its way more into conversations and you know certainly it had been doing so you know, earlier than the, the kind of like 2015s, 2016s, like, you know, uh, cottage brands going back 30 plus years mm-hmm. that uh, have been in existence. But it feels like it really, with the prevalence of, of social media, you know, anyone could bring a product to market. Uh, and that just meant that you, instead of having all of these like regional little tiny companies that existed in kind of uh, in their own little spheres, suddenly... You know, some tiny pack maker in Virginia is able to, you know, ship packs off to Japan. Yeah. Uh, because they're able to have a, a a footprint somewhere that people can actually see. Um, so I don't know if I if I really like. I felt I've been I've kind of always held this idea that you know I I think uh, I don't think that ultra light is necessarily any better than any other type of of backpacking. I think. In any any way that you can experience the the outdoors, regardless of what your gear is, is is a uh, is phenomenal. Um, and that uh, just by having like nice ultralight gear doesn't mean that you experience the outdoors any better or any more than anyone else. But I think that like objectively, there are elements of ultralight backpacking that I think just make backpacking more enjoyable for me. <laughs> I think I think it makes it safer too a lot of the time. Yeah, safer. Uh, I think it. Um, like on your body, I think uh, it helps me just to really reduce the amount of decisions that I'm that I'm making throughout the course of the day. It allows me to be more present where I am, who I'm with, with myself. Uh, I mean, I think ultralight for everyone is is their own little journey. I don't think there's any like base weight that you can get to and say, I have achieved this. Yeah, uh, I think it's kind of a unique thing that everyone tries, tries to kind of go through. But I think I had a sense that that this was an area partly driven by, I think, just the proliferation of, of through hiking and people really just the growth of, of long distance hiking in general. I think there's a natural phenomenon that when of, of wanting a lighter load uh, when hiking big miles. And so like that makes a lot of sense. And then I think some of just the fabric innovation that was happening around that time and that is continuing to happen. I think, uh, yeah, it's kind of like it was all of this like mix of fabrics and social media and i don't know just a hype around trails yeah uh, that really just felt like it was kind of culminating in uh a lot of people coming off of off of trips and starting these little these little cottage companies yeah man no i think i think you you definitely were just mm, i don't know if ahead of it ahead of the curve but certainly right there pretty good timing um and we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about how garage grown gear actually came to be then. But uh, first, I, I probably should ask this at the top of the episode. What What is your like backpacking experience? Like, wh- when did you get into it? Because obviously, mm. you're very in tune with what's going on um, when it comes to through hiking and and backpacking and the gear aspect. Certainly, um, yeah, dude. Wh- what got you into it? And yeah. um, what are some of the the trails you've done? Well, i I got into it through through paddle sports 
Um, I spent a lot of time doing uh, canoeing and, and various kayaking trips. You know, being in, being from the Midwest, like there are a lot of big bodies of water that are nearby, <laughs> um, and a lot of big and small bodies of water. So I, uh, you know, in in high school, spent a lot of time up in the Boundary Waters and in the Quetico in um, Southern Ontario. Just kind of, uh, I think it's Ontario. Yeah. Um, just uh, going on on canoeing trips up there uh, through like Y camps and then also just with with friends and family. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like when I graduated from high school, I started working at a at a summer camp um, that I worked at for about a decade. And they like really did a lot of um, yeah, like longer trips. They they really emphasized. Uh, tripping as like a big part of their their uh, of like leadership development and just kind of like growth and development as as humans in general. So I started leading trips, uh, kayaking trips up in the uh, Possible Islands on Lake Superior, and then um, uh, in the Georgian Bay on Lake on Lake uh, Lake Huron. Um, some trips up in the Inside Passage of uh, southeastern Alaska, and um, kind of just like. Yeah, pretty much like a lot of the a lot of the Great Lakes, yeah, uh, some other spots, and um, I just did that a lot of that and a, a bunch of like uh, personal uh, kayaking trips too. And really, sea kayaking was kind of my route into finding out and discovering that I that I really loved spending long periods of time outdoors. Um, and most of these trips would kind of go anywhere from a week to uh, you know just shy of two months. Um, and, uh, those were like mostly with high schoolers kind of 14 to 18, um, which is, yeah, like a really unique way of experiencing the outdoors is, you know, being in the wild with a bunch of wild and feral humans as well. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I think that just for me really, like there's something really wonderful about, about kayaking and just the proximity to the water and the closeness to this, uh, this thing that is both like all around you and incredibly powerful yeah uh, and that something that um just is ever changing uh you know water can uh especially lake superior is just such a um uh it just changes so much even throughout the course of a day from something that's completely flat to hanging out in in you know nine foot waves and uh paddling in lakes is so different than paddling in oceans it's just like it's it's choppier it's smaller it's like it just changes quicker mm. um and uh it's just like freezing <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh so I, I don't know there's like a there's a wonderfulness in terms of the connection to to water that i that i find with uh with kayaking and canoeing is kind of a nice like hybrid of uh you know when you're paddling you're looking forward to portaging and when you're portaging you're looking forward to paddling and there's kind of a nice symbiosis between spending time on land and spending time on water and um I kind of really only got into backpacking because I had led all of the different uh, ca kayaking and canoeing trips that I could lead pretty much. And I was kind of looking around at what I wanted to do the, the next summer. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll maybe I'll give backpacking a try. Are there any backpacking <laughs> trips that I can lead? Um, and I had done some like kind of shorter, like I'd gone backpacking in the in the Smokies and in the Porcupine Mountains and uh, a little bit on the Spear hiking trail. But like nothing, nothing in particular. But yeah. Uh, yeah, I like applied and to do this trip up in the this uh, uh, month and a half long trip up in the Brooks Range of of northern Alaska. Oh, damn! And, uh, got that, and that was like really my first introduction to kind of extended backpacking trips, and that was definitely the least ultralight trip I've ever been on in my <laughs> life. <laughs> like uh, going with uh, yeah a bunch of of high schoolers. I think we were going. 12 to 14 days in between resupplying damn there's like nothing up there we're getting drops by by flow plane um my pack is probably like 70 something pounds um and like you know i don't know it just like that wasn't the emphasis and also yeah. uh the brook Ranch, we're probably going like five miles a day through tussocks off trail with uh yeah with high schoolers you know it's, it's a very different <laughs> type of experience yeah but, um wonderful and rewarding in, it, in its own ways and just uh also some of the most solitude you know other than those uh yeah those six guys that i was with you know we'd go through periods of uh 
went probably for a month without seeing another person other than a, a float plane pilot. And so it's just like, what a way yeah. to get introduced to backpacking. Holy shit. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome, dude. It, it's, it's a lot. And also just like being emotionally dependent on, on high schoolers for an extended <laughs> period of time is like real weird. <laughs> I can imagine, dude. I could imagine. Damn, your yeah. whole, whole story of getting into backpacking is quite unique, to be honest. Kind of going from the kayaking, the floating thing. Um, that's cool to hear, man. That, that's yeah. really cool to hear. Um, and so you've done the, you threw like the superior hiking trail, right? Did you say that? Yes. That's really the only trail that I've I've actually through hiked. Um, I mean, I guess I've like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I did like the Teton Crest Trail, but um, yeah, I, ha- I haven't done any of the any of the three uh, uh, major through hikes, and really haven't um, had the the time at this point. To yeah, really I, I imagine do you're much. pretty busy, <laughs> dude. <laughs> I am. Like <laughs> oh yeah, and I'm sure you will eventually. Yeah, when when um when the time is right, of course. Yeah, that's right. I yeah, I would love to do the Superior Hiking Trail. That I've I've said it before, but like that trail's been on my list for a long time. I've never been to minnesota before that part of the country at all really so i i'd really like to hike that trail and then on the garage growing gear website i saw something about how you were planning to hike the centennial trail did you end up doing mm-hmm. that no oh damn dude <laughs> i, I want that's, a, that's another trail that's like i'm i really want to hike for some reason uh-huh. even though i don't know much about it to be honest and so i was hoping that you did that so i could pick your brain but that's no, okay. i i want to it's one of those things that i feel like every Every year, I'm like, all right, I'm going to hike something in October because that's like a little bit of a slow time for garage grown. It's also fall. Bugs are gone. Uh, it feels like a beautiful time of year to be able to do that. And then October always rolls around and I've got 8 million other things to do. <laughs> and uh, I don't do it. But I was I was hoping to this year. I was hoping to hike the border route trail. Uh, What's that? Year. It's um, So is that like the northern terminus of the Superior Hiking Trail? Uh, it's just like a, it goes along the Canadian border. It's just like a 60... Uh, a 60 mile trail but it's you know i feel like with with midwestern backpacking we don't have a ton of trails but the ones that we do are kind of like a midwestern rite of passages in terms <laughs> of like uh if you backpack in in minnesota or wisconsin there's like the sht and the border route trail and the keck and like you have to have spent some time uh in the porkies or um you know uh uh, uh, uh isle royale uh, there feels like there's like a handful of ones that are like, oh yeah, these are ones that, you know, they might not have all of the the sexiness of the PCT or CDT or Wonderland Trail or mm. Colorado Trail, but they're kind of like the the Minnesota uh, Midwestern um, trails that you that you that you should uh, you should give a go. <laughs> Interesting. I've never heard of this border route trail. I'm looking at some pictures of it now. Though this looks really cool. It's rustic. Man, I'll, I'll um, have to add it to my list. <laughs> Damn. Yeah. You know, uh, if you, uh, Kyle, if you come up to Minnesota, you're you're happy to stay with us here. I'll happily give you a, a ride up to uh, up to the SHT or the Border Route Trail. Hell Just, yeah, uh, man! Holler. Yeah, dude. I I would I, like I said, like the SHT has been on my list for a while, so um, I will eventually. It's also kind of a similar thing with me now, like doing YouTube and content full time. It's like it's harder, it's harder to take time off because totally. you got to keep working. So, but yeah, it's your no, uh, but I mean, obviously, I'm not going to stop hiking so no i i will get up there at some point um okay dude so let's go back to garage grown gear so when did when did you start working with garage grown gear when did you start working under that name like how did that all happen Mm -hmm. yeah so i had i had known about garage grown for for a while while i was running big outdoors um and at that point um garage grown so garage grown started in 2013 and it was outside of uh, of Jackson, kind of in the Teton Valley area of uh, of Southern Idaho, and um, it was started by my business partner Amy Hatch, who is still based out of kind of the Driggs Victor area. And at that point, Garage Grown was um, it had a lot of it had elements of ultralight brands, so it had um, it was like one of the first retailers of, of Hyperlight and had sold uh, enlightened equipment kind of when both of those companies were a little bit closer towards their towards their starts and were a little bit smaller, similar to like companies like um, Good to Go and Purple Rain Adventure Skirts. Can't remember all the brands they, they started with, but it was a bunch of um, some ultralight companies. And then it also had uh, some like small brand yoga mats and some small brand climbing gear and like a small brand skateboard. 
Um, so it had some ultralight stuff, but it was kind of like general, kind of like more general scope in terms of the types of products that it carried. It was more like about supporting startup uh, outdoor companies. So mm. if you think about stuff uh, that you found on Kickstarter or... Um, yeah, just like a little bit more, like some ultralight, but also a little bit more lifestyle-y type of stuff. Okay, yeah. Um, which, uh, yeah, was um, kind of where where Garage Grown Gear got its start. And um, yeah, then I guess I had ended up entering into a giveaway that Garage Grown Gear was entering, kind of just for kicks and giggles. I was like, all right, yeah, I'll throw my email down for this. And um, I ended up taking second place in the in the random giveaway and so i got an email from amy who i had never communicated with before and she's like congratulations you won the giveaway and i was like oh cool i run this random website you've probably never heard of called big outdoors <laughs> and she was like oh i actually have heard of that that's cool neat like nice and then that was kind of the end of that conversation but um uh a couple months later uh i was going to outdoor retailer the big outdoor show and at that point it, well, i guess it's yeah, now it still is in Salt Lake City, but it went to Denver for a little while. Um, and uh, I met with someone that she was working with there just to like meet up and connect. And he let me know that Amy was looking to sell Garage Grown or some type of exit strategy for her for Garage Grown. Um, she had kind of just been, she'd been doing it for a couple of years at that point. Um, I think uh, she had a lot of, she had just had a, a kid, a lot of life stuff going on mm -hmm. and just, you know, small businesses are a total grind. Uh, and I think she just was needing someone else to take it over or it was going to shut down or some kind of change needed to happen for or her with it. Um, and so I didn't initially think much of the conversation. I was like, well, I can't buy the thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm totally broke and like, uh, yeah, can't do that. But I just had the idea of like, well, maybe, I guess I could like, maybe like merge companies with it if that was something of interest. Um, because Garage Grown just had, a, you know, it had been around for a couple more years than us. It had like some email subscribers. It had mm, some web traffic. A little it had more like, established. A little bit more established. It kind of just had like a, like a, uh, you know, it had like an operating agreements and like policies and all stuff that me with having no idea what I was doing with Big Outdoors just like did not have the operational kind of stuff together. Yeah. So, yeah, I reached out to Amy and was like, well, I can't buy it. But if you're interested in, in kind of diving into some type of a merger, um, I'd be I'd be interested. And so uh, we kind of did this like um, interview process where she like called references of mine and I called references of hers <laughs> to kind of see if this like could even be a good fit for each other. Um, and, uh, eventually I ended up driving from Minnesota to, uh, to where Amy was living. And, um, we, I drove out there in my little Honda fit and, uh, we spent like three days kind of just like talking through what this could look like and what would kind of be needed to, to bring it across the finish line. And um, at that point we were like, all right, uh, let's do this thing. Let's merge the companies. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll keep the garage green gear name cause it's uh, more of an established thing, but that uh, I would, I would take over as the, yeah, the CEO and managing member and that we'd move everything to where I was based out of, uh, out of Minnesota. So um, I loaded all of the inventory, which at that point fit uh, in my Honda fit uh, <laughs> in about three, like, um like uh like three little bucket things um and uh i was still had enough plenty enough room for me to be able to sleep in the back of my honda fit if i if i wanted to and drove it from idaho back to minnesota into my uh into my basement and that's kind Wait. of how things moved from uh from Idaho out to Minnesota. How um, the hell do you sleep in a Honda Fit, dude? You're <laughs> those are so small, and you're you're a big dude. So they're they're surprisingly roomy. I gotta say. I mean, you know, <laughs> for a, for a tiny car, those seats go down, uh, and uh, you can make it work. At that point, I was like, I didn't care. You know? Yeah, <laughs> dude. What what were the emotions like on that on that drive out to meet her? Like, I, what's going through your head? Like, were, is it excitement? Is it nervousness? Is it like? optimism like what i just imagine that must have been you know having some time to just be driving and kind of stuck with mm -hmm. all those thoughts like i imagine that must have been kind of a trip yeah that's a good question yeah i think it, i think it was I mean, at that point 
like with big outdoors i thought all right this is going to be a really slow build um i had yeah again really no idea what i was doing i thought i had a good idea but again background in anything but business i wasn't i wasn't exactly kind of like with garage grown like garage grown i don't think was hitting the stride that it wanted to and that's kind of why Amy was was looking for an exit from there. And I wasn't sure exactly what to do with Big Outdoors. So I was kind of floundering a little bit about what I wanted to be doing. I was still teaching at the time and uh, was just kind of at a crossroad, kind of in, in mid-20s land, trying to figure out, uh, yeah, if this was like a career change moment or if this was a lean in or a lean out type of yeah. thing. Um, so definitely that like 17-hour well, drive was a lot of a lot of thinking, a lot of like, this is a big also just like a big risk for for me um because i was essentially yeah, yeah i was gonna exit teaching garage Grown at that point was like super broke oh so like you I were was, you were going all in full time at this point yeah it was something that like it uh oh, man the stakes are even higher then huh for sure and i mean i love yeah, it dude i love it there was like you know i don't know i think we got a couple thousand dollars in the bank account uh at that point with uh with garage grown um which was a couple thousand more than I had in the bank with big outdoors. <laughs> and it was like, definitely like a show and prove type of moment of like, yeah, if, if we wanted something to happen with, with garage grown, it was going to require a, a very large lift and commitments and time and energy. Um, but I think at that point, like, I don't know, uh, I don't, you know, I guess this was like seven years ago. So I was like 27 or so. Like I've been in a still, you know, my, my then, uh, then girlfriend, now wife, you know, we didn't have any like real responsibilities. So I was like able to sink yeah. in 80, 90 hours a week into just like willing this thing into existence. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think by, by moving it from Idaho to, to Minnesota, really just like lasered in on the thing that I was interested in, which was ultralight backpacking. Um, and, uh, just kind of like decided to go all in on this one space um so we'll frequently talk about it like amy is still very involved in garage grown she handles all of the content side of of uh, of what, what we do and a lot of the kind of uh, her and i collaborate on a lot of big picture planning um but uh yeah we kind of talk about it as like a, a version one version two type of thing that uh for the current iteration of garage grown to be successful it needed the initial iteration but that they're kind of two relatively distinct and different things like the first iteration was out in was in, out in Idaho and then it moved out to Minnesota. It kind of became something different, you know, building upon the the bones and structures that that their kind of initial iteration had uh, had helped support. But uh, yeah, that we kind of really found our our stride here the the last couple of years, just kind of laser focusing into into cottage ultralight spaces. Yeah, so. man, so cool, dude. I, I love hearing this. Is kind of a unique uh, episode of Trail Tales. Like here, and obviously it's still, you know, through hiking, backpacking related, but I don't know. I just, I I can't help but be kind of a sucker for the, like, I went all in, I quit my <laughs> job, that kind of like story, dude. Like, I yeah. love that. I love it that. It feels like a long distance hike at times. You know, it's as much like mental as it is physical. Uh, you know, it's about like keeping your brain in the game, finding ways not to be able to burn out. Uh, you know, finding finding people to be able to pick you up when you need it, uh, knowing when to kind of just like lower your head and, and, and pound out miles. Like, I don't know, about having like enough, having the right resources around you at the right time, like making sure you're taking care of yourself in the process. Uh, eh, there's a lot of, lot of different parallels because uh, yeah, businesses like just don't, I think that's a lot of things that people don't think about when they think about cottage brands. There's kind of like a glorification of what cottage brands are is like they're these really cool things that um are small and uh you know people sewing backpacks in their basement and that that vibe is 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 a really authentic genuine and that is the lived experience of a lot of folks but uh to be doing that is very hard yeah <laughs> man like it's it's not it's not like the easy money route to making gear uh it's the grinded out way of of doing things and so that uh yeah you know the cottage industry is just full of a lot of folks that are that are really willing to figure out how to be able to make it work and i'm proud that garage grown definitely comes from that ethos of uh of kind of grittiness and uh willing to to, to figure out how to make something happen yeah dude incredible so obviously 
you know, that that's kind of how you got started under the garage grown gear name. But, you know, as you kind of alluded to there, you know, over the last number of years, things have really um, taken off. And it sounds like you guys are doing pretty well now. You're obviously a very established name in this community now. Um, so I guess my next question, and, and I'm taking a little bit of this from the story page on Garage Grown's website. Mm-hmm. But um, it sounds like in the early days, you know, shortly after you guys merged, say, you know, the finances are tough. It's just the two of you, you're trying to build this into something. And so my question is just, and this is a very open-ended question, so just take this wherever you want. But so you guys, I'm sure money's quite tight with the business. You're working with a lot of brands that are so small, and I'm sure their money is tight as well. Mm-hmm. How the hell did you make that work like i just (laughs) this is what this is one of the things that even to this day i still don't quite understand about garage grown gear it's like you guys are selling a lot of gear that is just you know made by companies that are just one or two people and obviously you guys aren't a giant company either and so how especially in the early days yeah let me go back there how the hell did you make that work like what did it take dude i mean it's an it's an in uh it's a continuous problem and and question i mean i think like uh you know, I think it's something that if if Garage Grown, if 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 what we did with Garage Grown hadn't happened, someone else would have done this idea. Like, I think we kind of just hit it before someone else did. And for that, like that timing is is really wonderful for us. But I mean, the reason why Garage Grown in this space doesn't have a ton of competition is because they're just, it's just not that profitable. Um, you know, the brands that we that we work with, a lot of bigger retailers just would not touch. Uh, I mean, we sell products that people haven't seen from brands they haven't heard of with profit margins that are bad. <laughs> <laughs> and like, that's a that's a hard sell. Like we we take brands that have no proven track record and like we do a lot of the legwork into making them visible. Um, so it's not only that we have a um, it's not only that like we buy those products and stuff sell them but we have to create our own demand for it like we take a lot of risk on with that mm. and we do it at low margin um which yeah you know i, I think it, it it comes down to making sure that you are thinking about your partnerships as long-term plays like we don't partner with brands so that we can sell a couple packs and then peace out like we are working with brands for as long as we can you know i think cooler cloth is a great example small brand i met anastasia when she was just showing me a square sample of a of her pea cloth uh i don't know yeah probably five six years ago on the steps of outdoor retailer and i was like that's cool and anastasia is really awesome and that's going to do really well so like we were their first retailer jumped like full in with them with placing placing orders right away and you know now they're in every rei in the country so you know it's, it's something that not that like you know i'm not trying to equate to say that garage grown is the reason why that happened but we've been able to be a part of Kula Klot's journey to be able to be a supportive part in that. And like, we've also just benefited from, uh, from the growth of that brand. Yeah, man. Uh, and, uh, that's, and you know, like we talk a lot about it, that it's a, it's a management of an ecosystem with garage grown. Like we have brands in our site that we straight up lose money on, like no questions about it. Like I could list a half dozen brands right now that when we sell their products, when it comes to timing for picking and packing and margins and returns and credit card fees and free shipping thresholds and, you know, affiliate commissions with, uh, through affiliate links and discount codes, like it's straight up just a loss. Um, like no, no questions asked, but then we have brands on our site that we do make money on and we need to have enough of those to be able to substantiate the work that we do for the brands that, that don't. What's so the really, what, what's the benefit then to selling some of these brands that don't make any money or, or lose money? It sounds like yeah. I mean, I think the benefit for us is a little is a little tangential. Um, I think the benefit for us is just the the curation of interesting products that we think are good and that deserve to have our attention and okay. that deserve to be shown to our community. Um, and I think the benefit for our community is still having access and kind of still having that all in one type of shopping experience where they can get that that cool thing. Um, and the benefit for our brands is even when they're really small and can't really afford to sell us things at, at particularly profitable rates for us, that that at least for us is a foot in the door. You know, they might be able to give us better margins in a year. 
They might yeah. scale up, you know, start doing their processes differently and eventually be able to roll out different pricing to us. And like, we're here for that. So we very, we, we really try to have the finances not be part of our decision making. Like, I, I can't even remember a, a brand off the top of my head where the margin was the reason why we couldn't. Interesting. Um, that's that's really cool to hear. And that's actually um a perfect transition into another question that I really wanted to ask you, which is, so what do you, if you're not, you know, paying super close attention to the margins, then what do you guys look for in mm-hmm. new brands to take on? Because obviously there's a lot out there now and there mm-hmm. seems like there's new ones popping up every day. I get a lot of freaking emails. I'm sure you get even more. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. What do you guys yeah. look for in, when you're taking on a new brand to sell? Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, I, we don't have any like particularly strong criteria, like a little bit of it is just kind of like vibe fit and feel of, is this a, like, it, but it, it fundamentally starts with a product. Like, is this a good product? Is there a use case within ultralight backpacking for this product? Uh, and I think for us, like that use case, like rarely are products just like good or bad. It's the question of, do they have a use case for some element of our community that we think is valuable? Um, I think about products like a Mayfly sandal, uh, one of our most controversial products. I feel like I use Mayfly this as an sandal. A lot. I'm not familiar with that. I'm look, They're I'm essentially like a corrugated plastic. Uh, sandal that like weighs I don't know around an ounce um, and it's essentially like just a platform for your feet and that you that has strings that connect at this platform oh, to so your it's feet. just like an ultra like camp shoe basically totally yep that's and, pretty uh, cool people... 1.8 ounces per pair that's not bad dude I've been looking for some some ultra like camp shoes for a long time and haven't really been able to find some so I might have to they're check these out awesome. When you compare them to going barefoot, they're great. When you compare them to bedrocks, they're not. Right. And so, like, if, if for me, it's just about, yeah, is there a use case for that product? Uh, and then the next part is, like, do we like this brand? Like, is this brand going to vibe? Like, do the things that they believe in align with the things that we believe in? Uh, do they do business in ways that resonates with the ways that we do business? Um and uh, some of that is just kind of that, like, we don't we don't want to uh, work hard to promote and market, like, products and people that we don't w- like. <laughs> sure, of course, <laughs> you know, It's yeah. kind of, like, that straightforward. Like, if, if there are people out there that are doing, like, actively bad things in the world, like, we don't want to put our time and energy behind promoting their stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, are there compelling stories that are behind there? Like, uh, I think that's one of the most amazing things about the, the cottage industry in general is that it, it's it's a constant evolution of things. Uh, there's so many new brands and new people and in, entering the cottage industry all the time. Uh, so, like, is there a compelling story behind what this brand is? And can we come, make that come to life on Garage Grown? So, uh, yeah, starts off with the product and kind of ends with the, with the people and, uh, and the stories behind them. Um, and yeah, you know, we're constantly evaluating new and new and different brands pretty much all the time. Like we get sent some really funky stuff. Some of it really hits, some of it really doesn't. Um, we try not to like gatekeep what we do, but like also part of what we're, what Garage Grand Gear is, is a curated site. Like we're not unbiased, like we're heavily biased. <laughs> <laughs> like we only, like no one wants us to be a, a unbiased platform. Like we want to be able to put the stuff on the site that we think is best for our community. Of course. Yeah. Requires some bias, but yeah. Yeah, dude. Um, I'm looking at these Mayflyer, May, May, Mayflyer, Mayfly, uh, sandals. That's a cool mm-hmm. idea. Um, yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to check those out more. So what are, you know, what are some of the mistakes that you guys have made along the way? I'm, I'm curious about this too. Like when it comes mm-hmm. to business, you know, you guys are doing great, obviously, but there's no way you've, you've nailed it every step of the way. Can you no. think of any, like, mistakes um, off the top of your head that, that you guys made, um, you know, in order to get to where you are today? Oh, far too many, Kyle. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this is going to sound a little corny and cliche, but I, I feel like uh, when when one is in existing in the small business space, like so much of what you do is is viewing mistakes as learning opportunities or ways not to repeat mistakes you're like what can i learn from this like if you don't think about them as teachable moments for yourself you're just going to beat yourself up about it um so i think like having grace for oneself and for one's limited scope of knowledge is like super important of course um of course but yeah i mean things like i remember when when we were kind of 
when I was um, kind of just getting into into Garage Gear and Gear stuff, like we had a a feature from from Gear Junkie, and like we didn't have like a like a spot for people to enter in their their emails to our newsletter list when we were uh, on our on our website at that point. So like <laughs> we had a bunch of people come to our site, but like we didn't really capture anyone's information from it. Um, and uh, stuff like uh, uh, I don't know, there's just like always silver bullet. Uh, yeah. things that you think are going to be able to work or partnerships that you think are going to be great but they're not um you know also just like inventory misses like definitely bought some stuff that i should have been way more conservative with but really launched full into um thinking particularly about it, one of our kind of like mainstay uh, uh brands that we carry who i who i won't name came <laughs> out with a product that uh I thought was going to was going to hit a lot harder than it did and we still have a crap ton of inventory on this one product that has since been discontinued. Is it the toothbrushes? No, I'm just it's kidding. not the toothbrushes. <laughs> oh dear god, do we have enough of those? Um, but uh you know, it's it's just like yeah, like inventory misses are are kind of tough and they sit on the shelves and remind you every day that oh. that they still haven't sold. <laughs> That's funny. Um but you know, sometimes you you also have to like I used to have this Michael Jordan poster in my uh in my basement um that was just like a it's around that quote of like you you miss all the shots that you don't take a type of ethos yeah yeah and uh you know for every brand that i've messed up or every product that i like have bought too much of there's brands that i haven't brought in, bought enough of or there's brands that have a hundred percent you know hit it out of the park because i found them at the right time mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so like just having a little bit of like forgiveness and grace of course for self is uh you have to important. and 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 it it's quite obvious so maybe i it's not even worth saying but i'm gonna say it we say a lot of obvious things on the show or, or i do anyways it's like if you don't make those mistakes you know that's a lot of lessons that you wouldn't have learned yeah and for you sure. know i think that not that i'm some uh business guru, guru by any stretch of the imagination but i think that pretty much anyone who starts an endeavor you know um, a, a business endeavor is, is gonna have those moments and for myself yeah. certainly with with youtube and with this podcast you know i've made a lot of mistakes as well and, and you learn from them so that's why i wanted to ask that question yeah um, no it's a good one i mean i think it's it's the, along the lines of like making mistakes is not an anomaly like it, it is the process so yeah. like if you can't if you can't learn with, if you can't figure out how to deal with making mistakes, like you're just not going to be in this for the long haul. Exactly. Uh, because yeah, there is no isolating this into being a process where things just go well. Exactly. Um, it's just not how things, that's also just like not how life works, you know? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. Yeah. All right, dude. So obviously garage growing gear, you guys sell so much different gear, so many different companies, bigger ones, smaller ones. You obviously know a lot about, you know, what's going on in terms of these cottage companies, probably more than most people, uh, certainly. And so big question, I'd like to hear a couple ultralight slash cottage gear companies that you think more people need to know about. Maybe some underrated ones. Um, yeah, just three, let's go three companies that you think everyone should know about. Nice. Um, I would say first, uh, All Man's Right. All um, Man's Right? Yeah. It's this uh, dude, uh, Liv, and his uh, wife, Jen, who live out in New York City. And um, they make gear. I think they just moved into a, uh, into a new studio, but they were, like, making all their gear in their apartment for the last couple of years. Um, really wonderful people making really interesting products and designs. Um, uh, uh, some of the few uh, makers of color in the space. And uh, they, uh, yeah, Liv has like a designing degree from Parsons School of Design, like super legit. His designs for his products are just so intentional. Um, and he like mostly makes kind of small stuff like steak bags and little stuff sacks. But they, they make this steak bag that, you know, once you have, interacted with the steak bag there's no reason to ever have another steak bag in one's entire life uh it, it's like a tapered steak bag that has like a big opening up top and then it gets really narrow towards the bottom and it's like easy to open and close um yeah i don't know it's hard to describe but 
there's just a level of intentionality to the things that they do, which is really fun. Definitely calls upon some kind of of the the Japanese designs that are really coming through um, uh, within the ultralight space at the moment, and uh, definitely worth looking at. Cool, man. Um, I would say Farpoint. Uh, they make alpha hoodies. Um, oh, that's right. I, mean, I just heard about these guys for the first time um, at Trail Days. I think. I think they, my friend Corey was talking about them. Yeah, they were they were there. I mean, I think uh, like there's a lot of really great alpha makers in the space now. Like we we love Senshi Designs. Uh, there's this company BTT that just kind of came in the space. Vado, um, but Farpoint is one that has really been uh, kind of like on their on their grind for a while now, and I think just makes like an incredibly you know it's it's like such a simple product, but they do it so well. Mm. Um, it's just like a very well fitting kind of that perfect balance between not overly athletic fit, but also not feeling like you're, you know, wearing a trash bag. Uh, <laughs> it just kind of like hits you in the right spot. And alpha is just such like a cool fabric. Um, so if you don't own some type of alpha hoodie, it's definitely like worth, uh, and adding to one's, one's. Apparel. Yeah. I just went on their website and the featured picture like right on the front of the website is quadzilla who was our guest last week so how oh, about cool. that good for yeah, far yeah, yeah. <laughs> he uh he he yeah he wears their stuff and um yeah certainly <laughs> i'm sure he put some miles on oh, that uh, yeah, on that <laughs> yeah. i imagine now these um, look these look cool yeah like i said i just learned about farpoint and i still don't know much about them but um for i just heard about them for the first time right before uh, trail day so it looks oh, like awesome. thirteen thousand followers on instagram it looks like i'm surprised i haven't heard about them until recently yep. it looks like they're like you said they're quite established at this point they're they're doing their thing they do a lot of drops through through garage ground like we get monthly pretty big monthly shipments from them uh which is always a fun thing for for us uh yeah and i'd say maybe this is a company that more people know about but uh goosey gear um pretty like straightforward down products like they make little down booties uh, to keep your, your feet warm while you're sleeping and um i love my pair of little down booties and uh if you need something to keep your toes warm um mm-hmm. they're really great <laughs> hell yeah I've, I've heard of these guys but yeah i i don't really know too much about them um and the the person on their website looks suspiciously like ib tat i don't actually know if it is because uh-huh. IB Tat looks like a lot of hikers, to be fair, with beards, but <laughs> that would be funny. Um, <laughs> goose feet. I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to look into these guys a little bit more too. Yeah, they're. Cool. I've never tried. I've never tried um, down booties before. Pretty great for. I mean, especially like this time of year, getting into the fall and winter. I feel like they're one of like the lighter, more comfortable things that you can add and suddenly start uh, enjoying your sleep more. Yeah, definitely. It seems like it'd be beneficial. So, mm-hmm. cool, man. I'll have to uh, look into these companies a little bit more. Thank you for, um, I really thought you'd be the perfect person for that question <laughs> just because you guys work with so many companies, uh, obviously. No, um, I'm mostly just concerned about, you know, uh, whenever I get asked like, what is like, what's your favorite pack or what's your favorite this? I always feel like um, if there are uh, brands of ours that are listening, that they're uh, going to send me some dirty emails afterwards. <laughs> of, uh, what do you mean? You like them more than us. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I didn't say what your favorite ones yeah, were. I just true. said ones you think more people need to know about. Ooh. Yeah, and that's so, true. And so I appreciate you sharing those. Um, dude, you know what time it is? What time is it? It's story time. We're at the end of the episode. And um, I so, so for everyone listening, there's this trend on the show of me holding myself accountable when I don't give my guest adequate heads up about the story at the end of the episode <laughs> thing that we do here. And I've, I will say I've been pretty good lately. It's been a while since I've forgotten to remind someone. However, I, I forgot to remind Lloyd about this until like an hour before the recording. So he did have some heads up, but not as much as I usually try to give. So I, uh, I will own that. I apologize, but it sounds like Lloyd, you still, we're able to think of a story, yeah? Yeah, I've got one for you. All right, dude, let's do it. Yeah, uh, so I was trying to think about, I have I have a better kayaking story, I think, than that. Uh, that's totally fine. Story. That's fine. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, this was a, a, a couple of years ago at this point, but I was um, leading a, uh, a training trip for um, a bunch of uh, kayaking guides who are going to be going up to paddle, uh, to lead trips up in, yeah, the Inside Passage. 
of um, Alaska. And uh, so it was me and um, four, uh, four guides that we were doing like a couple day trip in the Apostle Islands and we were practicing rescues and uh, kind of going over pedal techniques and instruction techniques. Um, and that is always kind of like a, was like a very fun way for me to kind of uh, get involved in um, in doing trainings without having to do the time commitment of uh, doing longer trips. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was a couple of other training trips that were happening at the same time. Um, and they were like much bigger groups with uh, uh, less experienced paddlers who were going to be leading um, significantly smaller trips. So like uh, five day trips. And um, so basically just visualize uh, like three different groups kind of in a in like a 20 mile area all kind of doing their own thing um and uh yeah uh it was the last day of these of these training trips i think it was like a two or or three day thing and um we had found out that there was gonna probably be some rough conditions the next day uh so like a lot of things on water uh it was it's always pretty much always calmer in the morning so the earlier you wake up the calmer the water is going to be and uh, Lake Superior can certainly kind of change pretty quickly. Yeah. So we woke up super early, and we had about a, a mile and a half paddle into uh, to get to our uh, to our pickup, um, where everyone was going to get picked up that morning. So we woke up, uh, paddled on in, no real problem. Like definitely waves were getting like kind of choppy, but again, we had, I was with some pretty pretty experienced paddlers, and it, like really wasn't that big of a deal. So we like loaded up our boats at the at the van and we're just expecting to like sit there and wait for the other groups to be able to show up um and uh so i think i was like sitting there like reading a book waiting for these two other groups and um started like listening to the radio a little bit and saw that there was like a small craft advisory that uh that had come on out um and started getting a little concerned because i hadn't seen any of the groups appear anywhere uh Mm. uh on uh, kind of the horizon and you would definitely expect to be able to see boats at this, at this particular, particular moment. Sure. And uh, eventually we did see a group uh, pop up from, from around uh, this, this little bend and they came on in and had had just a really hard time being able to get there, but they got there just fine. Um, and uh, they had not heard from the, the other group that, uh, that was coming on in. And there was about a group of about 10 paddlers. Uh, and then like, probably about like 15 minutes later, we saw these kind of dots pop up on the horizon. Um, and, uh, uh, we're like, oh, okay, that's where they are. Um, and then we just kind of like kept an eye on them and it just like really looked like they kind of had like stopped moving. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and then it became like very clear that they like had stopped moving. <laughs> oh no. Um, and we got a, a, a radio from them that uh that they had someone who had who had capsized and Oof. um like superior at this point it was like early june like water is still like you know, pretty cold 34 to 38 degrees Yikes. like very cold um and you know you can go hypothermic pretty quickly in those type of conditions um and uh so not really thinking too much about it like myself and two others um who were you know fairly strong paddlers like jumped into boats and and started uh kayaking out there um and we had uh uh also like called the coast guard as we were going but coast guard is sometimes super responsive and super not mm. um as so we got out there and it was probably like eight or nine foot waves like it was really gnarly like not conditions that you would ever paddle in that i would ever paddle in uh, without like a real reason <laughs> yeah uh but we paddled out to this this group and it was like kind of stumbling upon like a crime scene almost like all of there was yeah uh, a handful of boats there was two people that were in the water the leader couldn't get the person back in their boat and it, everyone was just kind of like stuck and frozen in time um Jeez. and uh one of the the folks that i had paddled out there with had capsized and gotten blown uh into shore himself so it was just two of us that ended up making it out to there to this group um and they were just like freaking out definitely one person was um was definitely like in stages of hypothermia not particularly Damn. responsive um and we ended up uh yeah like having this group just head towards a really sketchy landing um just to be able to get them out of the water uh we ended up a, a boat had at that point had already drifted um a couple hundred yards away and there was like no way to be able to get that that had their their um their satellite phone in there uh, and like a bunch of other like stuff that <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, definitely should have had. I think their first aid kit was in there too. Oh man! Um, but we ended up, yeah, pulling these these folks uh, out of the water onto the, onto boats, um, uh, like putting a line on one of their kayaks and and towing them into into shore. And, and right about at that point, the the coast guard popped up um, and uh, ended up wrangling up our boat um, and not really doing much other than kind of making sure that we got to shore. But uh, it was one of those moments where uh, every single part of that felt. Ex- extremely sketchy and everyone ended up being fine but um one of the folks uh yeah was like definitely it was like pretty pretty traumatic for for the group in general we had a couple of folks who ended up not leading the trips that they were going to lead because they just didn't feel confident in what they were doing after that which i guess is not like the worst uh element of a training trip of uh you know uh, making sure that people do feel confident if they don't that they probably shouldn't be leading trips necessarily Right. Um, but uh yeah it was one of those moments that was just a really epic reminder of uh even like fairly competent paddlers can find themselves in conditions that uh you know <laughs> you're just hanging on for dear life <laughs> yeah dude yeah dude super sketchy super yeah. sketchy um i think it's been a while perhaps maybe never actually that we've had a paddle story on here i'm sure we have a while ago maybe but thank you uh thank you for sharing that um yeah Dude, what a f- what a great episode! I'm super stoked on this. I can't wait for everyone to hear this, and uh, I'd love to have you back on uh, sometime soon because yeah. I could pick your brain about garage growing gear all day. I'm super fascinated. So, so thank you, man. Seriously. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, Kyle. You know, it was great to meet you at PCT Days. I, I love what you're doing with the channel, um, and uh, and just the what what you contribute to to our community. So, thank really you, appreciate man. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, dude, I appreciate that. We'll uh, we'll talk soon. And thank you, everyone, for listening. One more time, go check out the new Trail Tales YouTube at Trail Tales Pod. All the episodes are up on there, and we'll uh, we'll be doing some video podcasts soon. Starting to dip my my feet into that. So go subscribe at Trail Tales Pod. I'll have a link in the show notes as well. And thank you so much to everyone for listening. Woo!